On this episode, we take a frightening look back at the Samut Prakan radiation incident. So, if you sometimes wonder if Thailand's lax rules and regulations can lead to danger, you actually might not want to listen to this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawa di crap, you're listening to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 to escape the Canadian winters, but I feel I was too successful because now when it gets down to the low 20s, it's too cold to swim in my condo pool. Ouch. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 19 years ago, fell in love with the three weeks of cool weather, and I never left. (laughs) Nice one. We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Joe Reed, who supports us at the show shadow level. Stick around after we're done talking about the Samut Prakan radiation incident to hear why Joe might have a social advantage over all of us, despite being, in his own words, uninteresting. A huge thanks to all of our patrons like Joe who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our regular show a day early behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our interviews, discounts on swag, which you can find on our website, and various other things that aren't available to our regular listeners. But best of all, patrons get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and random topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about the challenges of working with other foreigners in Thailand, which was suggested by Joe. To become a patron... Head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. And uh, before we jump into things, we want to mention that there is a new post on our resources page on our website, which we just added for season four. Uh, this one is a few thoughts on Thai culture that Ed wrote. And I thought it was I thought it was really well done. Really, uh, really insightful, Ed. Very, very good job on uh, digging into some of the foibles of, of, of working in a strange culture for Westerners. So thank you, dude. Yeah, if you're interested to hear what Ed has to say, check it out. It's on our on the resources page on BangkokPodcast.com. All right, <clears throat> ah, this is going to be this is going to be interesting. Uh, this episode is another one in the series called Bangkok History Highlight, where we discuss an interesting, notable, or lesser known person, event, or thing in Bangkok's past. And this week, it's the fairly recent and very scary event called the Samut Prakan Radiation Incident. Now, we all know that safety measures in Thailand are often not up to the same level of the rigidity that us Westerners are sometimes used to. Uh, Everything from rusted steel grates to dodgy playground equipment to random ropes and wires hanging at eye level. Uh, Normally, it's something that we just get used to working around and perhaps results in an increased level of vigilance. But in this case, we're about to see where Thailand's sometimes uneven adherence to regulations turned very, very dangerous. So this thing is kind of weird because I think it happened like right before I came to Thailand. And so it was something like in the background. It was like in the news. But I, 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 to be honest, I don't really know exactly what happened, but I vaguely remember it. Yeah, I don't remember it at all. I just randomly stumbled across it and reading about Thailand online. And I thought it would be inter- an interesting show. And it's it's sort of one of those things you're like, oh, damn, we came real close to getting real bad, even though it was already pretty bad. So uh, a little bit of disclaimer as usual, Uh, you know how Thailand works with uh, libel laws and all that stuff, so most of the names have been left out of this story, but if you want to learn more, Google is your friend, and just head there and uh, Google the support kind of radiation incident, you'll find out way more, probably way more than you want to know. So a little bit of background, Ed, I'm not sure how up you are on your uh, radioactive elements, but Dude, I'm an expert, (laughs) I'm an expert on radioactive elements. Oh, well, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, uh, uh, I'm... (laughs) <laughs> dude i know i know nothing right. like everything i know i learned everything i know i learned from the netflix show chernobyl that's like that's it that's what i know right okay okay god that was that was gnarly all right well this is all about an element called cobalt 60 and cobalt 60 is a synthetic cobalt isotope that emits gamma rays highly penetrative rays that are used in radiotherapy and industrial equipment sterilization and also to turn innocent people into giant raging green monsters 
But um, elements like Cobalt-60, Ed, are also used in machines like the rotational Gamatron teletherapy unit, which is one of the most common methods of treating cancers and other diseases that react to targeted radiation. Okay. So, picture it. 1999, a Bangkok hospital retired one of its Gamatron units that it had bought in 1969, so it was at the end of its 30-year life. But because the distributor wasn't the original manufacturer and the manufacturer no longer made them anymore, there was a bit of back and forth about who would do what with this machine. And as they are tightly regulated by the OAP, that is the Office of Atoms for Peace, which is Thailand's nuclear regulatory agency, you can't just dump these things in the local junkyard and forget about it, right? I mean, they need to be very strictly and carefully dealt with when they're done being used. But due to some confusion with paperwork and general bureaucratic inefficiency that is by no means endemic to Thailand only, uh, the machine ended up being stored in an unused car park. And the car park was fenced off, but like many abandoned car parks and buildings in Bangkok, like the uh, like the ghost tower where people party on top of, uh, the fence had been cut open in a few spots and locals used to play football and hang out there and do random things, you know, drinking and probably a couple of homeless people sleeping in there. So it was by no means a secure spot to dump these very dangerous machines. Right. So on January 24th, 2000, two scrap collectors bought a metal cylinder from two random dudes who offered it as scrap metal. And later on, of course, it was found out that these random dudes got this cylinder from the teletherapy machine that was abandoned in this parking lo- parking garage. So um, they bought this thing, the cylinder. They didn't know what it was. The guy said it was scrap metal. They're like, yeah, sounds good to us. So a week later, on February 1st, the scrap collectors and a friend went to work on the cylinder with a hammer and a chisel. Whoa. Now keep in mind, this the cylinder was 42, 66, 66, 42 centimeters tall, 20 centimeters in diameter, made from lead, tungsten, and steel, and weighed 97 kilograms. Wow. <laughs> like this tiny thing weighs 97. You remember that, that line from Jurassic Park where he picked up the night vision goggles and the guy said, are those heavy? And he said, yes. And he said, then they're expensive. Put it down. You know, like, I'm really wary of things that are really heavy. You know? <laughs> well, let me just say this. I, you know, I don't, I don't know any of these details, but this sounds like the beginning of a movie. Right. Yeah. Like an alien invasion movie or a, a pandemic movie or something like that. Like just innocent right. guys making the wrong decision. <laughs> Either that or like they're about to discover like the blob from outer space, like sealed in some container, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Well, you're not far from the truth. So anyway, these guys went to work on this thing with a hammer and chisel, but despite their best efforts, they only managed to crack one of the seals on the outer layer, which is a good thing. But undeterred, the scrap collectors took the cylinder to another junkyard where someone used an oxyacetylene torch to cut it open. And once it was open, the two pieces of tungsten fell out of the cylinder, and these were the containers which housed the radioactive cobalt. But for whatever reason, the actual cylinder containing the cobalt pellets which was only about three centimeters across and five centimeters long, was overlooked. Like it fell out of the thing and kind of rolled away or something like that. For some reason, they never saw it. So um, these guys continued taking the mechanism apart and put it in pieces in various piles. This goes there, this goes here. Uh, And they wanted to sell it later as a scrap metal, you know? So basically that, let me just clarify. So basically that cylinder does not adequately seal it from releasing radiation. So So that cylinder is a releasing radiation is what you're saying. Right. Well, I mean, once you bust open the main seal, like these guys had to really work on it with a torch to melt the outer side. Like it's got like, if you do, if you do a Google image search for like a teletherapy uh, cobalt container, like it's got like, you know, it's, it's very well shielded. And if it's not open, it's not radioactive. But once you open it, that's when the, that's when the trouble starts. But you take an oxyacetylene torch to most anything and it's going to open, I think. Right, right, right. So they figured it was a job well done. And off they went to work looking for the next uh, scrap metal score. And I forgot to mention real quickly, of course, this is Samut Prakan, which is the province just sort of south and to the east of Bangkok. So it's just across uh, across the border. Most of us have probably been there one point or the other. So by this point, there had been about six or eight people directly or indirectly involved in the operation, with most of them being in close proximity to the cylinder. And unsurprisingly, they started to feel sick. Some went to a local clinic complaining of itchy hands and headaches but it was uh, about six or eight days later, it got to the point where the scrap collectors, as well as several others, made their way to the hospital complaining of burns, nausea, swollen hands, diarrhea, fever, nosebleeds, and hair loss. Okay, so this really does sound like Chernobyl. I mean, it's, I mean, obviously it's a much smaller scale, but it's the same story, right? 
Right. And it sounds so innocent, right? Like just a couple of guys bust open this thing, but this was like a genuine, genuine nuclear emergency. And it, it could have been a lot worse than it was. But when these guys started feeling sick, um, they realized that, that something was not good. And actually, um, I don't really talk about it much here, but actually it's in the story if you read it. But the owner of the scrapyard where these guys busted the thing open eventually, after about a week, he was like, you know what? I bet it's all down to that weird metal those guys brought in. Get rid of it. So he went around and collected it all and like tossed it away. So he was he was kind of, uh, he was right, a bit late, but he was right. And another big tip off for the people, for these guys involved with something that was wrong was that a dog that lived at the scrapyard where these guys opened the cylinder, it mysteriously died one day as well, just dropped over dead. And they thought like, ooh, this doesn't look very good. Yeah, not a good sign. Yeah, no doubt. So this was around mid-February. And thankfully, um, the hospital that these guys went to was on the ball. So on 18th February, after reviewing their data and talking to other doctors, they notified the OAP, the Office of Adams for Peace, and told them of their suspicion that there had been a radiological breach somewhere in Samut Prakan. After interviewing the patients, inspectors from the OAP headed to the scrapyard entrance where they measured a radiation dose dosage of one millisievert per hour. But near the source, which was inside the scrapyard, it was 10 millisieverts per hour. Now, um, there's a, I looked into this and radiological measurements are really, really complicated. And I got overwhelmed real quickly, but... Basically, radiological measurements are cumulative. So if you're getting one millisievert per hour after five hours, you've been exposed to five millisieverts. You know what I mean? Right, right. Right. So just for a bit of a bit of a uh, comparison, uh, 68 millisieverts was the estimated maximum dosage that evacuees who lived the closest to the Fukushima nuclear accidents got. So so the bottom line is if you, uh, if you live close to this or if you worked in that scrapyard, you were going to definitely get an overdose. Yeah, you were you were getting dangerous levels of radiation. Yeah, especially, and this was just at the the one millisievert thing was just at the outskirts of the scrapyard. If you were inside, it was much higher. So the OAP cordoned off the area and began retrieval efforts. And they even used a five meter bamboo rod with an electromagnet on the end, as well as a platform suspended from a tractor that had a huge lead plate in front of it, which is just a really uh, effective but very Thai way of doing it. I mean, you're dealing with a nuclear accident and these guys are walking around with like a bamboo fishing rod with a magnet on the end, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, kind of a bit of a funny image. <laughs> so a few hours after they began, uh, the Cobalt 60 container was found and transferred to a shielded container. And once that was done, the radiation in the area thankfully returned to normal background levels and the IAEA, the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency, sent a team of experts to help with cleanup and treatment of the injured. So, but as with most radiation accidents, that was not the end of it. And of course, we have to mention what happened to the poor bastards that discovered this thing. In total, 10 people were admitted to the hospital with radiation sickness, four scrap collectors, the two scrapyard employees, the scrapyard owner, her husband, her mother, and her maid. And sadly, the two scrap collectors who found the device and the husband of the scrapyard owner died from complications of radiation poisoning. And in addition, 1,872 people living within 100 meters of the scrapyard were potentially exposed, and hundreds were given physical exams and blood tests to make sure that their level of exposure was minimal. Wow. I mean, it, it, it is a, a bad tragedy. People died. Mm -hmm. But it, it is one of those things that almost comes across as a near like a near miss you know it's it's, it's like one of those things where it seems like it could have been a lot worse yeah yeah and it's just crazy to think that like you you don't really think about that living in a major city um even as one with safety regulations are sometimes a little bit wacky like bangkok's are but you never hear expect to hear like a knock at your door and some guy saying hey uh you've got to evacuate the area there's been a nuclear radiation accident and you know you're like Jesus. yeah yeah that's not yeah not not normally on the agenda yeah. And if you're really morbid and curious, you can, uh, when you Google this stuff, there's a, there's a, an official IAEA report that has photos of the site, as well as photos of some of the injuries that some of these people got. And, uh, it ain't pretty. I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, like, like Ed mentioned that Chernobyl show, but it's, it's not fun to look at. Obviously I've, I learned about radiation in school and everything, but, uh, the good thing about shows like Chernobyl is they, they just show you what it's like as if you were there. And it's such an odd thing. It's just, it doesn't make normal sense because it's like, right. you know, you, you pick up this uh, piece of scrap metal and you throw it away. And then two hours later, your hand is like burned, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. It just doesn't, it doesn't make normal sense, you know? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's so rare. Like it, it only happens, you know, a couple of times every few decades around the world. And we're just, we're just not prepared mentally or experientially right. to understand what's happening. So it's, right. it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. That's a you good know? way to put it. Yeah. So as expected, there was intense news coverage of this event and there was a lot of misinformation floating around and even residents that lived near the temple that was going to host the cremation of one of the bodies protested thinking that when the body was burned, it would release radioactive ash into the air. Uh, But all of the nuclear specialists said this was not the case, but still people were scared, man. There was like protests and, you know, blocking off roads and and people didn't know what to make of it. And I'm just glad this was before the age of social media. Like this was in the year 2000. Like, can you imagine if Twitter was around or something like that? My God. I guess it cuts both ways. I mean, maybe it would have informed people, allowed people to evacuate quicker, but yeah, it also could have uh, instilled panic. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. But, uh, I mean, there was, like you said, it was a tragedy and there was a lot of bad news out of this, but some good did come out of it. And I'm going to read this from Wikipedia. It says the accident, along with other similar events, prompted the IAEA to reevaluate the effectiveness of the radioactive hazard trefoil. And that's the yellow and black three sort of three pronged thing that goes around a dot in the middle that most, most Westerners are familiar with as a radiation sign. Right. But, um. Yeah, because it says, although the symbol was displayed on the teletherapy head, none of those handling the device were aware of its meaning, nor were there written warnings in Thai. So, oh, yeah, good, good, uh, good point. Yeah, it's kind of tragic, and it's you can't really blame the guys, right? I mean, these are just like two scrap collectors from rural Thailand. When have they ever been in, you know, exposed or introduced or educated about nuclear radiation dangers? You know, like yeah, we grow up watching symbols. it on TV and TV shows and stuff like that, but not everyone knows about it. Yeah, you know, obviously those symbols are not technically universal. I, I guess they're trying to make them universal, but, you know, it, it takes a while. Yeah, and actually, actually you know, when you think about it, this, like, yellow background with the three little radioactive, you know, rays coming out of the things, it, nothing about it, if you don't know what it is, nothing about it says radiation. Nothing about it says danger. It looks kind of like a cool club symbol or like a, a motorcycle <laughs> rebel jacket patch or something <laughs> right like that, you know uh, yeah right you know yeah true 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 yeah so together with the international organization for standardization the iso the iaea developed a new symbol that would serve as an intuitive warning for large sources of ionizing radiation the new symbol was published in 2007 as iso 21482 and is intended to accompany the trefoil on internal components of devices containing dangerous sources to prevent persons from unknowingly disassembling them and uh, I'll include this uh, in the show notes too. It's a pretty cool picture. It's red, and there's a very clear sort of wavy ra- wavy rays coming out of a thing with a skull huh. and someone running away. So that's pretty clear. You know, this is uh, this raises a fascinating question about k- kind of like universal human communication and how to how to communicate something without language. Yeah, there's there's a whole I don't know if you know, but there's a whole like like sub culture, sub science, like there's a whole science around this um, about, you know, how do you make a sign now that will still be legible and understandable to people or aliens or whoever in a million years? You know, like they have this they have this around like nuclear waste dumps and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Sure. I mean, just something that graphically portrays meaning. It's uh, it's not easy. Right, exactly, exactly. So anyway, this was a good first step, the changing of this IAEA symbol. Um, But some said it wasn't enough. Social critics pointed out that the accident, along with several prior disasters, such as the Cater Toy Toy Factory fire, was part of a trend in which the country's rapid industrialization resulted in increasing health and environmental hazards due to poor regulations and a lack of official willingness to tackle the issue. Um, And they might be right, because check this out, Ed. In June of 2008, a cesium-137 sealed radioactive source was found among scrap metal sold to a scrap dealer in Ayutthaya province. The dealer recognized the trefoil symbol and notified the OAP, which responded and found no leak of radiation or contamination. Pretty good. But they could not determine the origins of the equipment. And in August of the same year, a recycling factory in Chachingsao province notified the OAP after a piece of scrap metal set off its gate detector alarm. The OAP found that the piece of metal contained radium-226 sources and concluded that it originated from unlicensed use in a lightning preventer, 
whatever that is. So stuff like this still happens. You know, you and I uh, joke about uh, the crazy tangle of of power lines and and wires in Bangkok, and obviously those are dangerous. But mostly, it's it's a just more of like a joke. But I mean, this kind of stuff is not a joke. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, and it's. It's, it's it sounds like you're right it sounds like a goofy b movie like these guys open a canister and the the, fit, right. the brain sucking aliens come out but this yeah, right. this was right. a very very serious potentially catastrophic event and um the fact that it almost happened again is it doesn't make me feel too safe well i i i i do feel and i know we've talked about this issue of safety in bangkok before i do feel like things are getting better you know, we talked before about how they they have taken down a lot of the wires on Sukhumvit and made them underground. Right. So at least they're aware of the problem. And it, it seems like at least they're aware of this issue of discarded radioactive material. They're at least they're they're at least aware of it. Yeah. And I should also say, too, that the, the, this was not malice. Like no one was like, ha, here's 5000 baht. Look the other way while I dump this in the river. You know, like it was just pure <laughs> oh, bureaucratic you know, it yeah. was just pure bureaucratic mismanagement. Someone overlooked, a, you know, they didn't have the right thing. And they thought, oh, I'll just put it here until we sort that out. And then, you know, it was forgotten about. So it, it, it wasn't like, you know, devious or someone trying to make some money on the side. It was just overlooked. But in this case, you could not have overlooked a worse thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Agreed. Agreed. So there we go. That is a story of the very recent, within the past 20 years, uh, Samut Prakan radiation incident, which got the uh, the World Radiological Association involved and sort of pricked up people's ears and caused the change of an internationally recognized radiation warning symbol. So and that happened uh, just across the border in Samut Prakan province. So probably not what they want to be known for, but there you go. All I got to say is thank God Thailand doesn't have nuclear reactors. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Although there have been talks of that, um, putting putting one in, but great nuclear radiation is really interesting because uh, nuclear power. Because it's you know there are people proponents who say it's the safest thing in the world, is the safest um, form of energy generation we have. But like statistically, that's probably true. But when slash if something goes wrong, like it's it's hardly ever a minor detail. Yes, yes, this is true. This yeah. is true. All right, there we go. Smoopercan radiation incident. Okay, let's get into some love, loathe, or leave, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something that we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. And this week, man, it is over to you. Okay, this is a bit random. It just happened to come up with a buddy of mine this week, and this might even be an old trend. It might not even be anything that's current, but... Right. I feel like among Thai women, especially younger women, I feel like they look at braces on their teeth as almost like a fashion statement. It's almost like, to, to, to me, to me, it's a little bit different than the way we think of braces in the West. I feel like in the West, braces are just this necessity that everyone just wants to get over with. Like when you're 12, 13, 14, it's like braces are not a good thing. Hmm, interesting. I, I know what you're talking about. I feel like in Thai culture among young women, it's almost like they're they're flaunting their braces. And I guess it could be good in that they're confident. But I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think? Do you know what I'm – is this making any connection? Yeah, and I have heard many stories of braces that are purely cosmetic. Exactly. Like they want okay. – you know, they're, yes. they're like colorful or rainbow or something like that. Um, yes. No, no. Okay. I, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm not hip. I actually wasn't even hip when I'm younger, when I was younger and I'm older now. So I'm <laughs> definitely not hip. Um, but I don't know. Do we have like cosmetic, like, like braces? Do people wear braces in the West who don't have to wear braces? Is that a thing? Man, I'm too old and too far gone to know what's cool anymore. Exactly. But, but I feel I, like... There's something about Thailand or Thai culture where I don't know what it is, but it's like it's almost like braces are a little bit cool. Whereas I feel like generally in the West, braces are uncool. 
Interesting. Yeah, I think I think um for well, first of all, if you have to wear braces, you shouldn't be ashamed and you should make them look as cool or as funky as you want to. It's up to you. But I do think it's part of a of a bigger sort of trend. I don't even know if it's a trend anymore. It definitely used to be of of wearing like accessories that are usually worn to fix a deficiency, but wearing them as an accessory. Like the a good example is glasses with no lenses in them. Like, I always thought that was really dumb. What, like, why are you putting this thing on your face? Like, it just it just seemed like a really silly way to use something that was that is designed to to fix a, a, a problem. Right. <laughs> I never really understood it. So um, if I would say if you're putting on braces just to look cool, eh, I'm, I'm going to say uh, live with almost on the border with with loathe. It's a weird thing because. Uh... If if the whole thing was, hey, let's be positive about the fact that we have braces. You know, it's kind of, you know, let, let's not be embarrassed. Let's just flaunt it. Let's, you know, then I would love it. Yeah, this is who but, I am. And if you don't like it, who cares? Great. But here's the but. I, I think, and again, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on this, but just the vibe I get is that I think some girls like have fake braces because I think they think it makes them look younger. Ooh, interesting. I never thought of that angle before. Yeah. I, I, again, I, so to me, it's a little bit creepy. I see. Yeah. To me, it's got like this potentially very positive thing, but also potentially creepy thing. So I think I'm stuck in the middle. I'm going to have to go, I'm going to have to go live with, I guess I'm stuck in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I say if you're doing it as a cosmetic thing and, and, and you know, want it as like an accoutrement, I mean, why stop at braces? Go for full headgear. Like, go all the way, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, <laughs> really. Fake brace around your entire skull. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pe- hey, people could start wearing like fake splints and just like fake crutches. It'd be like a, it'd be like a, a weird fashion statement. Right, like a torso cast meant to fix scoliosis, but you don't have scoliosis. You're like, ah, I'm just trying to look cool. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> any, yeah, honestly, any listener who has insight into the cultural significance of braces in Thailand, I'd really appreciate some some input. <laughs> I, I don't get That's it. Funny. I don't get I it. it. I really don't. Add it to the list of things I don't get. That's right. That's right. All right. Um, so as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Joe Reed for lending us his support at the show shout out level. And Greg, what did you find out about Joe? Well, as normal, I emailed Joe to ask him for some info on himself. And uh, he got back to me and he said, and I quote, I'm not very interesting, which was surprising. Because first of all, Joe, I call bullshit on that. I think by the very fact that you're listening to the Bangkok podcast, you're already pretty interesting. Uh, I think anyone who listens to the show is pretty awesome and has very good taste, obviously. So I have to disagree with you on the first point of contention there. But although I realized that was probably a bit of self-deprecation on Joe's part, I did get to wondering if maybe Joe was actually bragging, like secretly sticking a thumb in our eye at. So I did some digging around and I found an article in Fast Company magazine called The Upside of Being Uninteresting. Whoa. Yeah, and it went into some pretty great detail that I won't get into here. But to summarize, people who identify as, quote, uninteresting often have superior management skills, are especially reliable and dependable in the workplace. They have higher self-control and thus live longer, safer lives. Uh, they don't usually have to worry about blurting out something stupid or giving away too much info. And they have higher levels of emotional intelligence. Wow. So, Ed, I, th- I think Joe was actually saying in a roundabout kind of way that he's better than us. And uh, I have to admit, he's probably right. <laughs> well, if he's reliable and dependable and has good management skills, I, I think you're probably right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call myself uninteresting. But then I also go around saying stupid stuff and spilling too much details. It's basically the whole reason why we have this show, because we just love talking <laughs> into the void. <laughs> so. But we're interesting, Greg. That's all that matters. Right, right. And I think we're just proving our point here that by not by, by saying he's uninteresting, Joe is automatically saying that he is probably an all around better person than you or I. So Joe, cheers to you, sir. Thank you for your support and continued good health in your perfect life. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yeah, we really appreciate it, man. 
A final thanks to all of our patrons like Joe, who help keep the show ad-free. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcasts on social media, bangkokpodcasts.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yeah, you can also listen to each episode on YouTube, uh, chat with us online, or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone, and we will see you back here next week. Maybe, maybe our listeners are really into my ASMR, dude. <laughs> well, if that's something they can take up with you and them. I don't want to be involved in that. Maybe we'll get some more patrons. Like, can can I hear some more of Ed's ASMR? Like, I want to hear him eat eat, eat Indian food. Ooh. <laughs>